Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, I tell you what, I don't know about y'all, but I feel like I've had church, you know, and uh, this morning, and uh, just praise the Lord for that and what God is doing. Um, very, very thankful, and um, you know, he's he's on, he's he's gone. So I, I, um, I'm not necessarily bragging on Gene, but I tell you, um, he's been so faithful, you know, uh, leading our youth and our children's ministry uh, through the years, and and uh, it's just really cool to see what God is doing this year in the life of our youth. And um, y'all, excuse me, my pad just went black. Anyway, and. Uh, that's not good. You know, you say, well, maybe the short, the sermon will be shorter. No, the sh- sermon will probably be longer, okay, all right? It's the notes that keep me on task. And, uh, but if you got your Bible, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 18. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 2. And um, we're just making our way through, um, through the book of Ecclesiastes. And, um, and so we're ending chapter 2. And, um, and then next week we'll start chapter 3, um, and then Harold is going to preach for us the next Sunday, and then the next Sunday is our Faith in Blue. Uh, guys, we are inviting, we're inviting uh, some state troopers, and um, I know that I have three state troopers coming, okay, already, and um, some people from the Sheriff's Department, and also we're going to make the invite uh, to some police um, uh, the Lafette Police Department, and and every one of those guys or uh, ladies that come, we're going to gift them as a church um, with uh, dinner for their spouse or girlfriend, significant other, whatever that may be, or boyfriend, and um, you know, and it's going to be a really really cool week uh, weekend. I, I just I'm looking forward to it, and we're going to give them opportunity to share how you and I can partner with them to make our our um, our world better, and um, so um, y'all pray for them. Uh, me and Mr. Pettigo were talking. Um, there was another shooting um, in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, four killed, uh, sixteen I think were wounded, maybe eighteen. Uh, but um, you know, um, and and I'm, I just I don't want to get into a debate about gun control. But guys, it's not about guns, it's about people's hearts and where our world is. As I told Mr. Pettigo, you know, we live in a world that will kill a baby in a mother's womb. You know what I'm saying? And if we're willing to do that, the murder of another human being, you know what, that's not a big deal. You know, if we could take something so innocent as, as, as a, a child um, that just so happens to be in the wound of a mother. Guys, that's one reason why we need to give to this offering next week, you know, um, that we talked about, um, uh, that, that it can go to places like uh, that ministry and, and, and help give women, and men too, because behind every woman there's a man right there, you know, um, the choice um, for life, the right choice. And uh, so it, it's not just about what we're against, it's what we're for. Okay? And I'm for life. I am for life. And, um, you know, and so, all right, that's, that's enough and, uh, on that. Y'all please stand in honor of God's Word as we look at Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 18. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me, And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool, yet he will be a master of all for which I told and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned about and I gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who is toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What is the man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun for all his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. For also I saw is from the hand. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? 
For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after whim. Father, my prayer is this. May this word, God, be spoken boldly this morning. And may you accompany the word with your signs and wonders. Change our hearts. Save our souls. God, empower us to bring glory to you in everything that we say and do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. My... My immediate supervisor texted me yesterday, and when she did, um, she asked if I was preaching today, which um, got me a little nervous because I'm preaching about work today, you know? And I thought that maybe if she came that she would leave here with some <laughs> expectations, you know, of me, uh, uh, one of her caseworkers. And maybe she's listening online, I don't know. And I uh, think, think a lot of uh, my boss and the people that I work with. But, man, have y'all ever noticed just how many songs there are about work? Uh, I mean, here, here's a few. You know, Dolly Parton has got, you know, working nine to five, what a way to make a live. I'm like, who works nine to five? You know, I mean, I, I've never really have known anybody to work nine to five. And, uh, I mean, like seven to, anyway, never mind. Um, you know, the Bengals had, you know, just another manic Monday. I know y'all are glad I'm singing this. Alabama taught us how to sing, you know, working 40-hour week for a living just to get, anyway. Um, Donna Summers, she works hard for the money, you know. And then Huey Lewis in the news, you know, working for a living, and uh, which I don't really know the tune to. Anyway, but... Uh, you know, why, why is there so many songs about work? And, and the reason is, is because work, I mean, consumes so much of our life, doesn't it? You know, I, I, used, to, uh, I used to teach new hires at the prison there. And I would tell them that how important it was just to be nice to each other at work. Um, because the hours are long and I see most of them more than I would my spouse whom I would come home to and eat supper and maybe watch TV with. And, uh, you know, but for a few minutes before we went to bed and started the day all over again. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's, it's better to go to work where people are nice to you, right? I, I, it just makes sense. You know, I think about the, the Vogues uh, in their 1965 hit single, another one of those songs about work, uh, five o'clock world, they, they really captured a lot of feelings that people have about going to work. They said, you know, up every morning just to keep a job. I got to fight my way through the hustling mob. Sounds of the city pounding in my brain while another day goes down the drain. That's kind of how a lot of people feel about their job. Just another day going down. Well, here we have Solomon. By the way, here we have a man who's never had to punch a clock, a man who has never had to worry uh, about traffic, you know, I mean, like me, having to worry about that, you know, that all that traffic going to Carthage, uh, Tennessee, and uh, that, that daggum smiley truck. You know when I'm talking about that trash truck that's got the smile on the back? It always gets in front of me, and I just, you know... Solomon never had to worry about that. Never had to worry uh, about uh, getting laid off, and and uh, and and because he was king. But but here, the wisest man in all the world found work to be vanity, vanity, empty. After, he called it striving after the wind, which, which we've learned is like trying to shepherd the wind, you know, trying to find meaning in your work. And, and I get it, don't you? Uh, you know, I'm ashamed to tell you how many jobs I've had through my life, you know. And, and most of it was pastoring, but a lot of times while pastoring, you know, sort of like now, you know, I've had different jobs, you know. I, I've worked at a funeral home and cemetery. I was the last man that would ever let you down. Got 
Guys, I, I have I've worked, here's scary, I've worked as a car salesman. You know, I, I've, I, I've done a, a lot of different things, and, and, and hopefully I'm at my last gig that I will ever do, you know, working with the state. But, uh, but poor Solomon, this man has been trying to find something that is meaningful. And, um, you know, you, you've, heard, you've seen people, uh, I saw them this weekend around Nashville, will work for food. Well, Solomon, if he was here holding his sign, he probably would have something like this. I have everything, don't need anything, but still I'm miserable. You know, we have been following him on this journey as, as, you know, as, as he's tempting to fill the emptiness in his life. He's trying to fill it with wisdom and knowledge, and, and he's trying to fill it with pleasure. And, and last week, Solomon told us, man, that death is just the great equalizer. Because no matter what you do in life, we're all headed to death. I noticed uh, my little crowd over here has gotten, you know, they're, I, I guess, you know, I talked to them too much last week. I'm glad you're back, though, all right? And, uh, you know, and, and see, did y'all notice that? Now the, the, the youth are going over here. Like, I can't find y'all, you know? I know exactly where you're at. And, um, and so, I mean, we've got them spread out. But, man, I'm so tickled that you are here today. And, uh, but, you know, so Solomon's been on this journey. And, um, and, and so it just makes sense that if you're going to look for meaning in life, that, that, that at some point that Solomon would go deep into this thing called work, striving and toiling here on this earth. You know, it, it just makes sense because... It, it does consume so much of our life. And, and this is what he had to say. He said, I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun. I, I know you're like, I agree, Solomon. I hate work too. You know, whether it be working at McDonald's or working for the state or whatever you, you might do, you know, at times, I think we all could say, that we just hate our job. We hate it. You know, but what Solomon is doing, and I think that it's really brilliant, is Solomon, he, he's challenging our thinking. He's challenging your thinking about what defines you. Who, who are you? See, often even Christians, you know, and this is sad, often we're more bothered about what's going on at work than we are about the sin that's in our life. Sometimes we're more consumed about our job. And, and y'all, have y'all ever dreamed about your job? I have, you know. When I worked, went to work at, at the prison, you know, for a long time there, I, I would dream about what I was doing. And, and even now, working for the state of Tennessee. But too often, here's the issue, is that we define ourselves by what we do for a living and how well we do it, and you know, it, it, it's a priority in our life. You know, that means a lot. That, that we, even to the point that, that, that it defines us. Matter of fact, y'all think about it. When you meet somebody new, usually within the first 10 minutes of that conversation, you know, something is going to be said along these lines. What do you do? And we know exactly what they mean. What do you do for a living? What kind of work, you know, uh, do you do? Because too often we are defined by our jobs. But according to the book of Ecclesiastes, work is the absolute, it absolute is the wrong place to look for meaning in your life. It's the wrong place. Uh, Solomon, one of the wisest men who ever lived on this earth, under the sun, concludes that this thing of work too often becomes the center of who we are. The center. And and then he says this, and if you make it your identity, it's going to let you down. It, it's going to let you down. This area work, man, uh, uh, guys, uh, a lot of times 
we'll think a lot of a man if he works a lot. And, and I get that. I love a good work ethic. Man, I, I was taught at a young age. You know, before I could drive, I was, here we go, I was the bus boy at Penn's Fish House, you know, in Forest, Mississippi. My daddy would drop me off and I would clean tables. And then, man, I got promoted and I worked, went to work at Altman's Super Value, you know, as a, uh, a, a bag boy. I take groceries out and stock shelves and stuff like that. Matter of fact, we trail in America only South Korea, South Africa, Australia, and Japan, you know, as the most workaholic nations, you know. And, um, and so uh, countless more. Work can easily consume you. We, we take, they can, you know, did you know in America that there is a lot of people that uh, don't even take their vacation days? Not me. <laughs> no, uh, that's what they're there for, you know. And, uh, but, but, you know, or they come home, and, and I even find myself doing this as well. You know, uh, listen, I just want to just tell you, you're welcome, State of Tennessee, because even though I come home, and I don't really have a clock that I punch in and out. I still have that work phone, and I hear that email come through, and I look at it. You know, I'm working for y'all even when I'm off. But, but, you know, that just tells you just how much work can consume us. Matter of fact, they said that 80% of the workforce admit to taking work-related emails or phone calls after hours. They say that most businesses are getting at least 30 extra hours a month from their employees because work consumes us. Well, you know, um, before you go quit your jobs and saying Johnny was anti-work today, you know, um, can I just tell you something? Work is a gift from the Lord. Okay? All right? If you look in the Garden of Eden, right off the bat when God created man and woman, you know what he did? He gave them work to do. Okay, all right? Now, then the sin came into the world and uh, God cursed man and work got harder. You know, I mean, but, but work is a blessing. But hear me out. You know, and, and work cannot be what defines you. It, it cannot be your identity, but, but, but also hear me out today on this. You know, and, and some of you students are here, maybe you work at McDonald's or somewhere else, or, 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 or maybe school is your work, and, and, and you don't like school. You don't like going to school. You like going to school? You like going to school? You know, all right, that's, thank you for being honest. You know, you like going to school? You do? Anyway, no, no, I'm just kidding. You're not, not that weird. Just a little, anyway, but, but I'm glad that you do. But, but whether school or work, that can be a place where you glorify the Lord. That's a, that can be a place where you make his name big, where you show them who is the most important person in your life. And, uh, and so get that. Well, why, why, why not work? Why, why not being consumed with work and, and let it be your identity? I mean, I mean, why not? Well, the first thing is that the letdown of work, okay? Work will let you down. And in verse 18, it picks it up. He said, I hated all my toil, all my work in which I toiled under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool, Yet he will be master of all for which I told and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it, this also is vanity and a great evil. Now, understand this Solomon, he does hate toiling or work, not because his job was not a good fit, because sometimes that's what we'll say. 
hey, if your job is not a good fit for you, go get you another one, you know? That's not the reason why he hates it. And, and it's not because he's not making enough, because he's king. You know, he's very wealthy, king of Israel. I think Solomon would have told you that he had a pretty nice gig as king over Israel. But what he has determined is that his gig, his job, as good as it was, could not give him the meaning and the purpose that he was looking for. Okay? And that, that listen. And the first thing that he looks at is his return on investment. That, look what he says in this scripture. He says, you know what? I am actually working for somebody else. He said, I, I, I've been working, I've been building this kingdom, I, I, I've been taking in, I've been doing all that I can, and one day I'm going to die, and all my wealth and all my, my, my goods, everything is going to be passed down to someone else, and who knows what they're going to do with it. Matter of fact, he says this also is vanity, which means nothing. You know, it's, and, 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 and matter of fact, he says he turned to despair over all that work that he put in. Now, young people over here, I, I'm going to talk to you all enough. Let me, let me go over here. Listen, Trinity's shaking her head no. Listen, if you want to enjoy something, Go home and look up this show right here, Sanford and Son. Okay? All right? And, and my, my grandpa loved this show. I mean, it's, I, this was on when I was a kid, which means a long, long time ago in a, in a kingdom far, far away. You know? And, 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 but, but, but Fred Sanford, he thought his junkyard was an empire. <laughs> you know, I mean, everything in his home showed it. And, and he, he, would, he would look at his son Lamont and go, and one day, Lamont, this all will be yours. And Lamont's like, oh, you know, thank you, Dad, for a junkyard. And, 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 but you, you might be sitting here this morning, and you may be thinking, boy, my I love my kids. I can't wait until they are able to enjoy my, my fortunes or whatever. But the truth of the matter is, is we really don't know how our kids are going to spend it anyway. Matter of fact, Solomon even said here in the scripture that he wasn't for sure that the person who got his kingdom would, would, would do wisely by it or, by, or be a fool. But guess what? You and I know. Because his son was Rehoboam, who became the king of Israel after him. And, and Rehoboam was, like, can I just, guys, he was an idiot. I mean, he was an absolute idiot because the very first thing that he did as king was he alienated um, people. And, and as a matter of fact, he would alienate the ten northern tribes of Israel to the point that they would go out and start their own nation. And that's why you would eventually have the nation of Judah, which was the southern kingdom, and then the nation of Israel, which was the, the northern kingdom. It was his fault. And, and hear this out as well. Guys, Egypt would invade Israel underneath his reign. And they would loot the temple, and they took away some of the treasures that Solomon, his dad, had gathered. And, and this treasure grass included shields made of gold, which Solomon placed there. Matter of fact, after this would happen, they actually would put some shields of bronze to kind of pretend like the shields of gold were really there. So Solomon was exactly right. I'm building all of this, and my foolish son's going to come along, and, and he's not going to know what to do with it. Solomon had been very focused and determined in his efforts. He, he was very wise and knowledgeable and had skill, but, it, but all of that would be left to be enjoyed, don't miss that last phrase, by someone who did not toil for it. Someone who did not work for it. 
You know, think about how many businesses have been built over, you know, uh, by people and given to their kids only to see their kids do what? Ruin it. You see, when you give somebody something for nothing, you ruin a person. You do. You absolutely do. Yet under the sun reality is when you spend all your life working and toiling for something to gain something that you can't keep. We've always heard this adage. You've never seen a U-Haul behind a what? A hearse. Because you can't take it with you. You absolutely can't take it with you. And, and, and that troubled Solomon. That he thought about it. He said it really troubled him because all this stuff, given your heart and soul, you know, you'll hear daddy to look at his kids. I'm doing this all for you. You know, they never see dad at a baseball game. They never see dad, you know, uh, at a school play. And I did it all for you, you know, so that you could have the best school and the best clothes and, and all these things. And, and then, so Solomon knew all about that. And, and you know what he says? He says, all of this is what? Vanity. And a great, he called, he called it a great evil. And at this point, you might be thinking, man, that doesn't sound very spiritual. But understand, Solomon is talking about life under the sun, here on this earth. You know, uh, that is, uh, you know, this, this trying to do life without God in it. He says it's just all vanity. And so, you know, the letdown of work. But, but then he just talks about the labor of work, you know. I mean, think about it, just the word work. <laughs> Man, it just feels laborious, doesn't it? You know, I mean, he says, what is a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation. He said it's frustrating. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. It's almost like Solomon has been reading my mail. And yours too. You know, he said, there's a reason why we call it work. It's laborious. You know, it's not easy. He, he calls it, he describes things as striving of the heart. All, our, all his days are full of sorry and, and his work is a vexation. Even in the night, you know. Even in the night, you're thinking about it. You're thinking about tomorrow, thinking about what you got to do the next day. He's pointing out that what we would call the extreme stress that work can bring to your life. <laughs> my, I, I keep talking about Sydney, and if you were my kid, I'd talk about you too. Anyway, and, um, but uh, I talk about Sydney, and, and I, I hear her say all the time that she's tired of adulting. You know, she's finding out that work isn't, you know, paycheck, payday is good, you know. When I worked at the prison, you could always tell when payday was. We had a lot of young people that came to work at the prison because our parking lot would be empty, you know. You know, they would skip out work, call out that day, go spend that good payday that they made. And, and, and so, uh, you know, that's a, that, but, but work can be hard. It can be stressful. That, that's what he's saying here. The labor of work beneath the sun, the striving of heart. I mean, I think every occupation has its own unique demands. And no matter what kind of work we do, it all takes a toil on us. It can be exhausting for us. You know, uh, James Lindbergh said, there is too much strain without much gain. Life can be complex. It can be. Responding to different needs. Well, I, listen, I, one of the things I've learned since coming to work for the state of Tennessee as a caseworker is that probably about the time I get ready to retire, I may, I may completely understand the job. You know, it's quite dawning. I spend a lot of my days looking at policy and how I'm supposed to do, you know, certain things and, and not messing up. Sydney called me yesterday over a situation in her own job where she was worried that she had done the wrong thing as a caseworker for this nonprofit that she works, with, works at. But we all know work can be extremely stressful, you know. 
But, but understand this. I want to say it again. Work is good. It's good. And, and, but the problem is, is that we work in a fallen world that makes it hard. Matter of fact, listen, listen to Genesis 3, 17 through 19. This is where man has sinned and God is laying down the curse. You know, and so this is, where, this is where it all got messed up. And he says, and to Adam, he said, because you listened to the voice of your wife, and have, not, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. You know what he's saying there? Work is about to get what? Hard. It's going to be hard all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you were dust, and to dust you shall return. And so the Bible describes here why work can be a source of happiness, but at the same time it can be very frustrating. And the preacher's point in the context is not only is work vanity, because, you know, everything you're going to do, you're going to give to your kids, and who knows what they're going to do with it. And it may be that you know you think you're going to give it to the kids, and then next thing you know, the, the kids don't have it anymore. You know, because they did an auction and called Gene Carmen Real Estate and Auctions, and now the whole community owns your stuff. You know? Hey, auctions, you always get more when people are what? Dead, right? Than they are alive. You want your stuff to go for a pretty dollar? Hey, die, you know, and, and, and that's all you got to do. But you won't get to enjoy it. But guys, it, it represents, you know, what he says, it represents work, represents years of pain and stress, your pain and stress. That, that's why it, it, it perplexed him that, that he's going to die and to be left to somebody else. And who knows what they do with it? Because it was hard. Even as king of Israel, it was hard. And, and depending on your job or chosen career, the money, you know, over which you eventually have no control, I mean, it represents a lot of things. You know, it represents arguments. Anybody ever got in an argument at work? It, it, it represents um, your boss being mean to you at times or other employees. It represents impossible quotas and, and crushing deadlines. You know, to teachers, it represents... You know, uh, difficult students. You know, every now and then I'll ask Candy, you know, uh, I usually ask her about day two of the year. Have you put somebody in their place yet? You know, because there's always one or two just difficult students. Sometimes it means calloused hands and dirty hands and, and grease that you can't get off your hands, you know, and, and, and spots. And, you know, sometimes it means late hours or, or being away from your family. And he says, look what he says. He says, even in the night, he says, my heart doesn't rest. You think about it. You're consumed with it. You're like, man, what kind of difference do I make? Am I, am I making any difference? And so when Solomon considered that, man, all that a man gains from his labor under the sun, he says, man, really all it means is my days are full of sorrow and my, his work is what he calls vexation, which means frustration and and, and, you know, I mean, you, you, you go and you have a bad day at work and you come home and you kick the dog and, you know, you're mean to the wife and the kids and, you know, and, 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 and uh, it, it's, it's frustrating. And that's what he says. And, you know, and you're, you're trying, but guys, that, that's all you're going to get if you try to find your meaning in your job. Yeah. If you try to find your purpose in what you do, that's, that's your life. It's nothing but vexation, frustration, sorrow, you die, and maybe your kids are wise or foolish. I don't know if you leave anything for them. So why would a person even think about pursuing their job then? The answer is, is that if you don't have God in your life, the job will never give you ultimate satisfaction, but but you know what Solomon is doing here? If you want to make somebody thirsty, give them something salty. 
You see, he's trying to show you how frustrating life here on this earth is without the Lord. And, and, and he, he, he's, he's really good at it, isn't he? I mean, you, some of y'all read the book of Ecclesiastes before. You're like, man, this guy is just so negative And, you know, I just don't enjoy this whatsoever. And you want to skip it and go to the next book in the Bible. But the reason is he wants to show you just how bad we got it without the Lord. But you know, he does something in this passage that he hasn't done before. And, and the third point is this, is what I would call the love of work. See, there's nothing better, he says, for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil, in his work. He, he says there's nothing better to find enjoyment in your work, okay, or in your school. Or in you, you put in, uh, fill in the, the blank, whatever you do. You know, he said, there's nothing better. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, you can, him who can eat or who can have enjoyment. For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after the wind. So Solomon does something he hasn't done. He, he brings God into it, okay? And, and, and notice what he does. He goes from hating, he says, I hate toiling under the sun, to now he says there's nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find what? Enjoyment in his toil. What's the difference? You know, he, he says the hand of God is behind a person who can eat and drink and find enjoyment. The hand of God! You know, see, the capacity to enjoy things like food and drink and even work is something, the only way that you're ever going to truly enjoy school, work, whatever you do, it's the hand of God. It's God working in you. It's, it's God inside of you. And by the way, the only way you can have God inside of you is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay? All right, he says it's from the hand of God. That's the only way that you can enjoy things like work. See, he's already talked about pleasure and, and having stuff. He says, man, that stuff don't do it either. But man, but, but the hand of God, and, and you know, we've emphasized in the past chapters that he's been looking at this life under the sun but apart from a biblical worldview, but now he does something a little different. For the first time, he throws God in it. That God is the source of two things. First of all, recognizing God is the source of that job, but also God is the source of you being able to enjoy it. Hey, let me ask you something. Don't you want to enjoy your job? I mean, you got to do so much of it, you know. I know some of y'all retired, and I, listen, I don't think that word is in Mr. Pettigo's vocabulary, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, man, he's, he's going to work, and, and uh, yeah, you know, and, until Jesus comes. But, but you know, don't you want to enjoy it? So, so listen up, buttercups, okay? All right? Because... You're like, which is it, Johnny? He says a while ago, it's toil and labor. But now you say you can enjoy it. Which is it? It's both. I, I'm reminded of this cartoon right here. You know, uh, that's Charles Dickens. You know, the tale of two cities, which begins, it was the, the best of times and it was the worst of times. And so, you know, the publisher says it was either the best of times or it was the worst of times. It can't be both. Bring it back when you've made up your mind, you know. And, 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 but, but here it is. Which is it? Well, it's both. And work can be toil and it can be hard and it can be difficult. But can I, can I just tell you, it's something, dear believer, that you can enjoy. 
Notice what brings the joy. It begins in verse 24. He says, There's nothing better for a person than he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. And now earlier he concluded that work was a total drag, you know, but now he says you can eat and drink and even find enjoyment in your toil. Well, what makes the difference between finding enjoyment and it being sorrowful? Which, what's the difference? And I'm just here to tell you, the Lord is the one who makes the difference. You see, up to this point, he's, God has hardly been mentioned in this book. But now his presence makes all the difference. And according to verse 25, he says, For apart from him who's him, God, okay, Apart from God, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? So if anyone is having trouble finding enjoyment in life, it's because of this. Here it is. If you're not enjoying life, the good life, it means you don't have God in your life. You see, if you want to enjoy life, Guys, God must be at the center of it. Jesus needs to be in your heart. The Holy Spirit needs to fill your soul. You see, that's what he's saying. The eating and drinking that the preacher enjoys in verse 24 comes from the what? The hand of God. In other words, he's realized when you start living for yourself, and you start living, you stop living for yourself, you start living for the Lord, then you too can find enjoyment. The first thing you find is that everything that you come across is God's gracious gift to you. And you realize God is so, so good. Paul told Timothy this. He said this. He says, For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and, and prayer. He's like, man, when you recognize that everything that you have is a gift from God, including your job, including your work, it just makes you think differently about it, doesn't it? You know, listen, all those earthly pleasures that you get to enjoy are gifts, gifts from the Lord. Amen. Man, here, here in a couple of weeks, Kenny and I are getting to go with my sister and brother-in-law um, on a cruise. And yesterday, yesterday I was, I was looking at the menu. I've been losing some weight, guys. I, but you know, uh, that's not going to be my focus. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and man, just, just, man, that's, that menu's a gift from the Lord. There, listen, if you've ever been on a carnival cruise and, and you've got to enjoy a, uh, one of those melting chocolate cakes, let me tell you something, that's a gift. The goodness of God. Man, mm, yes. You know, guys, it's, it's, it's God's good. But you listen, you've got to recognize, man, this is a gift from the Lord. And if you're in legitimate employment, because everybody, not everybody's in legitimate employment, you know, you know what it does? It encourages you to worship the Lord. Man, God's good to me. Few things are better in life than to receive his earthly blessings as gifts. Listen, if you have a home today, you shouldn't feel guilty about having a home. That is God's gift to you. Now, I would tell you, leverage your home Leverage your vehicles, leverage your time, leverage your money for the glory of God. Use it for His glory. You know, Ray Stedman said this, he said this, he said, Isn't it strange that the more you run after life, panning after every pleasure, the less you find, but the more you take life as a gift from God's hand, responding in thankful gratitude for the delight of the moment, the more that seems to come to you. You know that you, you start enjoying life. It's strange but true. When you learn to receive everything in life as from God's hands, it just changes it. It, including work. 
Work, I'm going to say it again. Work is a gift from the Lord. There's a lot of people in this life that would love to work. They would love still to be able to have a job, but because of illness or something else, something has been taken away. Listen, I want to sh show you this. Work is a gift from God, but you know what? You work in a fallen world, and therefore some of those co-workers are mean to you and have nasty mouths. And, you know, and some bosses are cruel. You know... So listen to the secret. You don't make work your end all. But here we go. If you could just realize this, I'm going to take my work and I'm going to use it for his glory. Hear, hear me out on this. Or I'm going to take my school and I'm going to use it for his glory. You know... Um, to use what I do to love and serve God with. I used to be a part of a, uh, when I was an insurance agent, I would go to these different meetings and we'd always get up and introduce ourselves. And I, and I went to the Christian Chamber of Commerce and I would always introduce myself as this. My name is Johnny Beaver and I am a child of God cleverly disguised as an insurance agent. Listen, I am Johnny Beaver, guys, and I am a son of the King of Kings. Guys, I am a child of the Almighty God. I am His servant. Man, I am His, and I just happen to be cleverly disguised as a caseworker for the Department of Children's Services. And I tell you what, that changes everything. You see, you use what you do for His glory to magnify Him. You know, and listen to me. You say, well, my job won't let me talk about Jesus. I work for the government, guys, and we're here to help. Anyway, guys, guys, my, my job won't let me talk about the Lord. I'll get fired if I, if I, if I broke, break out my Bible. Let me tell you this. Guys, you don't have to be obnoxious with Jesus. Guys, be a servant. Man, how you talk and how you deal with sorrow and how you do your job. And, and listen to me. Does your boss believe that you you're a believer because of how hard you work. Yeah. Or are you lazy? You see, the way to experience pleasure in your work is you do it for Him. And by the way, the more difficult the work is, the more opportunity that you have to bring Him glory. Difficult work is more satisfying and even more enjoyable when it's done for the greater glory of God. Eli, you're a painter, man. I can't do that. I can't do it, man. Man, you come look at my living room where I painted. You know, and when there's white, there's gray, and when there's gray, anyway, listen, I can't do that. That's that's hard. It's very difficult. Not everybody can be a painter, man. You know, and and but but listen, difficult work is more when you do it for his glory. For the believer in Christ, man, our true boss and the ultimate master is the Savior. And by the way, it's the Savior who went to work for you. When Jesus came to this earth, he went to work for you. Hard work. Difficult work. You know, and so the Scripture commands us to hear, whatever you do, work heartily, do your best. As for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You're serving the Lord Christ. You do it for him. Y'all, they think, you know, say Tennessee thinks I work for them. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm doing it for him. And according to verse 26, this is what he says, and we're, we're closing up, but listen to what he says. He says, for to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and what? Joy. But, but to the sinner... He's given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give one who pleases God. This also is vanity and striving after the wind. And Solomon makes this clear distinction, doesn't he? 
for the one who has given himself to God, who has Jesus in his life, and he's serving the Lord in his work. Look what he says. He gives him wisdom and knowledge and joy. Y'all want to enjoy your work? Take this job and love it. You want to enjoy your work? Hey, serve him in your work. Serve him in your work, you know? And, and for those who are related to the Lord, he, he, that's, that's his promise. But, but then he says this. He says to those who are not rightly related to God, he, you know what? They'll dig and dig and dig, and they'll try to find satisfaction in their work, you know? And guess what? You're digging for something that you'll never find. You'll never find it. You're trying to find ultimate meaning in something that you will never find. And, and so then, therefore, he says, all you really are is a gatherer and a collector. Y'all see that? That's all you are. So you can either take this job and love it, you know, or, or you can be a gatherer and collector, and then you die, and you give it to somebody else. So in response to that reality, he says, man, this is vanity and a striving after the wind. That's his conclusion. So the question for us is this. Do I see my work as a way to find meaning in life or as a means to an end as I offer my work up to God in worship and find lasting joy? Is it, do you, do you try to find meaning in your work or is work a means to an end as you offer your work up to the Lord in worship? As you go to job every day, I'm worshiping the Lord. As you get behind the smiley truck that's full of trash, going to the trash pile in Carthage, you know, I'm doing it, I'm serving the Lord with it. And by the way, that truck does about 30 miles per hour up the hill that I can't pass him on, okay, all right? Just so you know. But I'm doing it for the Lord. 1 Corinthians 10 31. Paul, Paul says there, what? Whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. And Harold says to glorify God means that we give an attra- correct estimate, opinion, and appraisal of who God is by what we say and what we do. That you're showing the world who God is by what you say and what you do. That's how you bring glory to the Lord. And that's what he's calling us to do. And by grace, you do your work. You do your work. But can I just say this, that the only way, the only way that you can do this is have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so the question is, have you given your life to Jesus today? That's where it starts. And for you young people, I'm so glad that you're here today. And thank you for letting me pick on you. Ariana, love you. Okay? Love you. Just think. Think how much better your life would be if you give your life to Jesus right now. I'm just telling you. You know? Hey, I, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty getting on up there, you know. And, and uh, in age, I, what has it turned gray is turned loose. And, uh, you know, I, I guess, but I'm just telling you, my life is so much better with Jesus. It, it's so much better. So give your life to Jesus. That's where it starts. And then whatever you do, listen, what would happen if you went to Macon County Junior High, high School and you're like, man, I'm going to give God the glory in my life. I'm going to live my life for Jesus Christ. You know, what would, man, just think the difference you could make. I promise you, you'd be salt and light there in Macon County, guys. You know, but, but guys, but go to work and glorify him in it. And, I, and you'll enjoy it because he'll let you enjoy it. And then God will give you the gift of joy in what you do. Tim Keller just went on to be with the Lord about a couple years ago. Uh, he's got a book called Every Good Endeavor. And I, I've got it, and I want to read it. 
But I, I, I pulled out a quote, and I think this is good. He says, he says, and this is in closing, work is not all there is to life. You will not have a meaningful life without work, but you cannot say that your work is the meaning of your life. If you make any work the purpose of your life, even if that work is church ministry, you create an idol that rivals God. Your relationship with God is the most important foundation for your life, and indeed it keeps all other factors, work, friendships, family, leisure, and pleasure, from becoming so important to you that they become addicting and distorted. That is such a good quote. Let your relationship with God. I used to tell state troopers whenever I would go and teach them at the academy, and I haven't done it in a couple years, but I always would tell them this. I said, you can let your job determine your relationship with God, or you can let your relationship with God determine how you do your work. One or the other. What's your idol? Who are you serving? Who are you serving? So here's the, so what? So what are we going to do? Why do, you, why do you work? You need to answer that this morning. Because the answer to that question is going to determine whether you find joy in it. If all you do is work to make money, is if it all for the payday, let me tell you this, you're not going to find joy in it. All right? You may find joy on payday for just a moment, but you know what? Those pleasures end. That food gets eaten. That, that bill you paid, another one's coming, you know? Guys, let me tell you, if you do it for the money, you'll never find joy in it. All right? To enjoy work, it must start with your relationship with the, this holy God. And that's found only in a relationship with Jesus. Jesus is the only one that can make you, a sinner, have a relationship with this holy God. And let me tell you, some of y'all have been miserable because you've been fishing in the wrong holes. You've been chasing after the wind. You've been trying to find something and somebody or something that can only be found in Jesus. And I want to ask you again before we leave. Please give your life to Jesus Christ. That's what that young lady said a while ago. Please give your life to Jesus Christ today. Please do it today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this day that you've given us. And Lord, I just pray that God, that we will, oh Lord, uh, God, give you every moment of every day, even when we go to the job. Father God, I pray, Lord, for every believer here, that God, that they've been encouraged to take their job and leverage it to bring the Lord glory, to give a true estimate, opinion, and appraisal of who God is to this lost and dying world by our words and our actions. Father, I pray that today we would repent of going to our job and, and and Lord, and hating it. God, I pray that today, Lord, we would repent and we would have a change of attitude about what we do. And Father, I pray for the person who walked in this morning that doesn't know you as Savior and Lord of their life, that today would be the day of salvation. God, I pray that today would be the day they circle on the calendar where they said, I gave my life to Jesus today. Lord, help them to do that. Right now as I pray, help them to do it. God, help them to cry out, Lord, save me. Come change me. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let me look over and see what we're singing.